1981, God led us as a church, I'd been here for three years, to get a summer intern. So God brought a man from the East Coast, and uh, he spent the summer with us, and our church's life, and our life has not been the same. <laughs> How God could take a country bumpkin like me from a ranch and a farm and uh, unite me with a brother from New York City is the amazing grace of God. And our souls have been knit together since then. We both call this a clicker. We uh, have a lot else in common, but I want to tell you, he's a dear brother, a dear friend, and a great preacher. And uh, I'm so thankful because I've learned anew from a passage of Scripture that I never have preached on, that he preached on Friday, that I got to keep shaking off the snake. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look it up and listen to it online. But I am so, so thankful for all our missionaries here, but especially Pastor Matthew Rucker. So, Brother Matthew, preach the word. Thank you, Pastor Kent. You're a, a brother like no other. And Virginia, she's the only one who calls me Rucker. She's got her kids actually call me Rucker, too, so that's okay. Well... It is a joy to be here. I, I love your theme, have a servant's heart near and far, and we challenge you to have that servant's heart so much the more as that the day is approaching. And I did preach a message on how, to, it, as a servant, we have to shake off snakes and keep on serving, and don't get angry when people criticize us and condemn us. And then we spoke a little bit last night on how we're just ordinary people, but God can use ordinary you. We don't have to be an apostle uh, doing great miracles, but we can just go and chase for souls for Jesus as a servant with a servant's heart. Today, I'd like for us to turn to 2 Kings chapter number 2, and the message is going to be today on a surrender test. But before that, I just want you to look at this picture. This might not look like much to you, but this was the most beautiful sight that I saw this morning. Our deacon sent it to us, and that's our deacon and his family, and they go, they're the first ones there. They, this is where we meet on Sunday morning, and this is a public school auditorium, and one by one, the lights were going out in the auditorium. There were about six or eight lights in the whole auditorium, and let me tell you, it was like dark in there. There's no, there are no windows, and the lights were going out, and, and I even ca I called the, the custodial head. I said, hey, we could help pay. And get and help the, put the lights back on and get some lights up there. He said, "No, it has to go through the board of ed and blah blah." You know, it's it's like the bureaucracy, you know. And so then the custodian came to me last week. He said, "We might they're going to come soon to do the lights, but you might not be able to meet here on a Sunday." So then that creates us, you know, like I talked about getting kicked out. We have to find another place here or there. But then. I got this picture this morning, which, and, they, and the work was done on Thursday night, and so our church is able to meet there today. And, and I, I'm a little jealous that I'm not there for the lighting, but I'll be there, Lord willing, next week. But that, that was just a beautiful sight to me. And pray for our church this morning as they're worshiping our Lord. The surrender test as the message today, 2 Kings chapter number 2, and I'd like to read actually from verse 8 down through verse 14, 2 Kings chapter 2, and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle 
of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they were parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over on dry ground. So the message this morning is the surrender test. Let's pray. So, Father, we pray that this would be a moment of challenge to our lives, as life is no doubt filled with many tests. Maybe there are students here facing midterm exams and tests, but life has many tests. And, Lord, one of our great tests is whether we will surrender to you. And, Father, as we see Elisha be tested by his mentor Elijah to surrender, Elisha passed this test with spiritual tenacity, and we pray today that you would give us this tenacity to stand with you, to, to walk with you, Lord Jesus, and to live surrendered lives for your glory, and that you would call out from this place servants, surrendered servants, to go to the world and preach the gospel, to work with the deaf, to go to places like Solomon Islands, or if they're not convinced or sure, to take those trips and pray and consider and seek your face and surrender and be willing to do all and do anything that you call them to do. So now we just pray that you would be glorified in this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This passage is so full of, of amazing repetitions as Elijah is going to be caught up into the heavens, and everybody knows it, and Elisha sticks with him as they go first to Bethel and then to Jericho and then to the Jordan River. And then the repetitions that really catch my attention for our text today is verse 13 and 14, how that is repeated there. And so the repetition is for importance that he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, because that was the, that was the passing of the test. And then that is repeated also in verse 14, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. He had passed the test, and he was now taking up the mantle. So this is Elisha's surrender test, to take up the mantle of Elijah and carry on the work, the prophetic work that he had so powerfully engaged in. And so we also need to surrender our lives to God as Elisha surrendered his. And I pray that you're excited to do that. I pray that you're excited to engage in the service of Jesus Christ and to take up the mantle in this generation. We need men and women. We need young people to make this decision, to take up the mantle of those who have retired, who are getting older. We need a new generation of people to take up that mantle and continue to bring the gospel to Jesus Christ, perhaps in a far more hostile world, in a more antagonistic nation. We need our young people we need to be praying for our young people that they would be, have the power of God to take up the mantle. So there's three questions that I'd like to ask in this surrender test. And the first question of the surrender test is, what do you want? As we see that question in verse 9, when Elijah asked Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken up away from thee. Ask what I shall do. So Elijah gives Elisha, essentially, it's like a blank check. It is a blank check. What, can, what do you want me to do for you? And, and by the way, he asked that after he took a mantle and s smote the waters with it and it opened up. So if somebody could do that, if somebody takes a, a cloth and smokes the waters, they open up, he says, hey, is there anything I could do for you? <laughs> you, you would think he, he would be able to do some, quite a few things. And so what shall I do for you? So this offer probes. Elisha's inmost desire. He doesn't tell him what he should ask, but he's probing, what do you want, Elisha? Underneath all your lay layers, underneath all your actions, underneath all your words, let me ask you today, what do you really want? 
What is most important for you? What do you have an inner ache for? What do you desire deeply in your soul? And I believe the answer of that inner ache that we all have in our soul and the answer to this question as Elisha answers it is we need to be filled with the power of the Spirit of God. For Elisha answers, he said to Elijah in verse number 9, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Now, this matter of a double portion in Deuteronomy 21, verse 17, it relates, no doubt, to the inheritance of a firstborn child. And so what Elisha is asking is not for double the power of Elijah. He's not asking to be twice as effective as Elijah. He's not asking to do double the miracles of Elijah, although some say he actually did double the miracles. But that's not what he's asking. He's, he's asking not for anything monetary. He's not asking for a monetary inheritance. He's not asking for anything material. He's asking for God and his power in his life. This double portion speaks of receiving an inheritance. And what Elijah is leaving behind is a prophetic work which required the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when he says, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me, he is asking that he would be able to carry on the prophetic work of Elijah as his first, like a firstborn son and carry forth the Word of God and continue training and teaching these sons of the prophets and rescue a nation that was literally, this northern kingdom was not far from destruction. Even after the ministry of Elijah, things had not gotten better. Elijah's ministry, think about it, did not improve the spiritual condition of the nation. And Elisha's ministry will not save the northern kingdom either from, from ultimate captivity and from all the wicked idolatry, but God had raised up these two mighty prophets in such idolatrous and immoral times. And so Elisha's response shows a hunger for God. And he knew he needed the same power of the Holy Spirit that Elijah had in order to do the work. So what do you want? What do we need? Jesus said, without him, we can do no what? We can do nothing. But through you, you see, that was the message last night. How God can use the ordinary you. And it's through the hands of Paul that God worked. We can't do it, but God can do it through us as we surrender and as we ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I love that parable that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 11. And in that parable, the, the, when, when somebody came for bread and, and the man said, I have nothing to set before them. I have nothing in myself. We have nothing ourselves. We have nothing to give. But when we have the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God filling our soul, we have everything to give. This is what we need to be filled with God's Spirit. This is the first part of the surrender test. And we live in such challenging times. Haven't we come through such challenging times? This, this headline was taken during COVID in 2020 when our streets were being torn up with riotings and, and we were shut down and they were, trying to ch they, they were trying to shut the church town that time while the liquor stores, and we know that the liquor stores were open and the churches were told to shut down. Isn't that something? What a war we're in. And we need the power of God to serve Jesus Christ in these times, in these dangerous times and perilous times, and we must not be afraid. And our key verse one of my life's verse, Acts 18, 10, where Paul was afraid in Corinth, and God told Paul, be not afraid, speak, hold not your peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And we need to focus on God's presence and his protection and the people that he has, and not to be intimidated by men when they try to shut us down and shut us up. 
And that's why I'm thankful for this family that I just mentioned to you who sent me that picture earlier. Adrian and Susan Smith. Adrian actually worked at Northland Baptist Bible College, was, I believe, their IT director there. And when he saw things going south at Northland, he, he called me up because there was a school in Manhattan that uses the same software that Northland used, and, and they were offering him a job. And he, he interviewed me for over an hour, about an hour and a half one day, to see if our church would be a good fit for his family. And so we talked. This was over 10 years ago. And the Lord brought Adrian and Susan and, and their three boys, and they have a daughter now, uh, to our church. And what a blessing they are. I mean, he's one of our deacons, and he serves God. He's the first one there every Sunday morning. And as you saw in the picture, he, he goes down into our closet, and he gets the boxes out of our closet, and we set up a welcome table, and we set up a snack table, and we set up a sound system, and we set up the chairs. And usually by the time I get there, around 9.30-ish, I guess that's the new thing to say, ish, uh, everything set up so beautifully. Praise God for servants of Jesus Christ who seek to serve in the power of God's Spirit. And I read this verse this morning in my devotions, and it touched my heart how, of course, the book of Hosea was written to this same northern kingdom. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom who was bent on backsliding. And Ephraim shall say at the end, though, and there's hope for the backsliding nation. There's hope for those who have even turned from God. Even him shall say, what more have I any more to do with idols? From me is thy fruit found. And so may we have that heart. Whatever, however, I don't know how you've come into this place today. Maybe you've come in backslidden from the Lord. Maybe, maybe you're not even saved. Today, call upon Jesus Christ and let him be your Savior. Know that you're on your way to heaven. Trust that he died on the cross for your sins. You, you and I deserve death for our sins. We deserve death in hell. But Jesus Christ bore the wrath of God on the cross for us. He took hell for us. That's why he died on the cross. That's why his death was so horrible and terrible, because he was dying for your sins and mine and the world's. And when he rose again, he's alive, and we can call on him and have his life in us, have for his forgiveness and his blood cleansing us, and have his spirit come into us, giving us life. And where, however you come in today, you can walk out that door, a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if you're already saved, maybe you've been backslidden from the Lord. Come back to the Lord and say, Lord, fill me with the spirit of God, and for me that may your fruit be found. So that's the first question. What do you want? to be filled with the Spirit. The second question is, what do you see? What do you see? And so as the conversation goes on, here is Elijah's last spoken words in the Bible that we read in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 10. Elijah said, you have asked a hard thing. And that's interesting. He said, you have asked a hard thing. And it, you know why it was hard? because Elijah couldn't do it. Elijah, all the things he could do, he can open up the river with his, his mantle. Well, God did it through him, but you've asked the hard thing. He couldn't, he couldn't fill Elisha with the Holy Spirit. God had to do it. And that's ultimately ministry right there. We often are so dumbfounded and frustrated because we can't do it. We can't force God to do anything. We just have to trust him to do the work. So Elijah says, you've asked a hard thing. I can't do it, but God can. I'm reading between those lines. And then he says, nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And so he's saying to Elisha, you have to see me. You have to see me as I go up into these heavens. And then when Elijah did, I love the first few words of verse 12. The first three words say what? What does it say? Elisha and Elisha saw it. And Elisha saw, four words, it, sorry. He saw it. So what do we see? And here the challenge is for us to be focused on eternal realities. And so when Elisha saw Elijah go up, in those chariots of fire and in the whirlwind and went up, it says, into the heavens. What, what exactly did he see, though? Why, why is that so important? It says, 
there appeared a chariot of fire, horses of fire, and parted them both. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So what did he see? I believe he saw as he needs to have his focus on these eternal realities, as we've been talking, I believe, first of all, we could say that he saw the real world around him. The re and the real world around us is a spiritual world, which is actually invisible to our human eyes. We see a physical world, but there is a spiritual world all around us. And God opened up Elisha's eyes to see that, and that was also in 2 Kings chapter 2. Remember when the, the enemies were all around and, God pr and Elisha prayed uh, for God to open up the eyes of his servant, and he saw too, similar to what Elisha sees here. But Eli what, what does Elisha see? He sees the spiritual world merge into the physical. He sees that there is a spiritual world that we, that, that we don't see, but that is, and God is at work all around us and his angels, and there are angels and demon spirits, perhaps no doubt about us. And so there is a spiritual world that merges into our physical reality, which we do not see, but actually exists. And Elisha saw that invisible spiritual reality become visible. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. That's cool. He sees chariots of fire appear, and they escort Elijah to heaven. So he sees, is there a heaven? If there's no heaven, this story's not true. Because <laughs> Elijah went into, into heaven. God takes his children to be with him. This is almost a picture of the rapture that we will experience one day. People say, oh, you Christian nuts believe in a rapture? Well, Elijah was in a sense raptured and Enoch was taken up and we don't exactly know it just says he, he was not he was he was taken and but but Jesus talked about the angels carried uh, Lazarus into Abraham's but there's a lot of ways God could get us out of here <laughs> he could use angels he could use chariots or he could just snatch us boom like that boom you know what that word is that we're going to be caught up into the heavens you know rapture you know what that word is harpooned that's the harpazo boom and so Elisha saw it, that God was actively at work in spite, listen, in spite of the wickedness of his culture, God was at work. And God is at work in our culture in spite of its wickedness. God is at work by his very own power in our own culture and throughout the world today. He saw the real spiritual world. So what, what do you see? So what do I see when I see the city? I need to see souls dying, either going to heaven or hell. What do you see? So this is a, a little bit of what I see when I drive to church. On Sunday, we go over the Kosciuszko Bridge on the, on the BQE, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, and we look out and we see the skyline of New York and the graveyard below it, and it's just a, it's such a, a powerful sight. And then we, we go across the Willie B, that's the Williamsburg Bridge, and we see, we see all the projects and all the city housing and state housing, like dominoes, just one after another, and we see multitudes, and we drive into the city and we come we come to this school this is our school where we meet and this is what I see but I have to see beyond that I have to see that wow God is at work he's miraculously he's even miraculously providing for us and in our neighborhood this is what I see I see churches with rainbow flags all about even one another one this is not the one across the street but there's one across the street that doesn't look far from that what do i see in our neighborhood i see the stonewall inn and i mentioned this the other night and somebody asked me about it so i thought i would just mention just a little bit more but the stonewall inn is right there in greenwich village just a few blocks where we meet and basically in june 1969 there was an uprising and in this uprising it's centered in the stonewall inn and it was ultimately a protest against police harassment. The homosexual community was protesting police harassment, brutality, because the police were continually, sh continually shutting them down because they could not get a liquor license legally because of their homosexuality. And so because they were drinking in there, the police would shut them down and, and, and so forth. 
And so finally, there was an uprising that lasted for five or six days. As the sign says, Stonewall means fight back, smash gay oppression. They were tired of the harassment, the brutality, and the, and the oppression. And, and this was one of the early signs back in 1969, gay and proud. And so the homosexual community has, of course, held on to that word, gay pride. Isn't it amazing that they take that word, that there's not one positive use of it in the Bible? Pride always brings forth destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. But that's their word, because they were coming out of the closet. They didn't want to be ashamed of their lifestyle. They wanted to be proud and flaunt this, this lifestyle. And so this word has been associated very vividly with the homosexual movement since this Stonewall Inn ride. So across the street from the Stonewall Inn, there's a little park, and then they have uh, statues, two men together, two women together. And, and then right beyond that, they have the Stonewall Inn, and they've redone it completely. And this, this past uh, summer, President Biden came, Elton John, and they dedicated this Stonewall National Monument Visitor Center. So this is just done in June. And so th this Stonewall Inn riot or, or uprising happened in, in June 1969, and that's why they have the parade every year in June, and why to this day, so-called Gay Pride Month is in June. And so this was clearly a formative event, a seminal event in the history of the LGBT movement, and it's the only national monument dedicated to the homosexual community in the United States, and the first one, and perhaps there will be others down the road. But so this is, this is right in our community, and this is our group that will be going out today after church right across the street from the park that I just showed you where the gay statues are, and then behind that is the Stonewall Inn. So this is our neighborhood. This is our community. And so God has put us there. So what do I see? I see souls that are broken. I see souls, many of them, that have been abused. And I read this recently that a new study of researchers Vanderbilt found that 83% of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer individuals reported going through adverse childhood experiences such as sexual and emotional abuse, worse mental health as adults when compared to their heterosexual peers. And the, the homosexuals are not my enemy. They're just sinners who need Jesus Christ and a Savior. And we need to imp have patience toward all men, and we need to patiently preach the gospel to them and pray that only God, only God by his power can break through and save souls. Pray for us. Pray for our group that goes out today. And then we not only need to see the real spiritual world around us, but we need to see that there's a spiritual battle, the real war. And notice this now. Because he speaks of chariots and horses, and we know that chariots and horses are the key elements of, you know, of an ancient army. You know, an army that had a lot of chariots and horses was a powerful army. And so God from heaven sends forth chariots and horses to pick up Elijah to show his power that there is a warfare going on. There is a battle going on. Now, Israel was not at war at that time, but there was a spiritual battle. And Elijah is seen as well, if I'm reading this right now, because when Elijah goes up into the heavens, then Elisha said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel. In other words, he saw Elijah as the power of the nation, the chariot of Israel. He saw Elijah as the horseman of the nation. In other words, he was the strength and power fighting this military struggle in the nation. And when I thought about this as well over the years and thinking about rivers opening in the Bible, this is an amazing passage of Scripture because the river only opens in the Bible four times and two times is here. And we know the first time that was at the Red Sea. And that's, in that time, the battle was behind them as God was leading Israel to form a nation at Mount Sinai. And of course, the second time was at the Jericho River, where God had led Elijah to on this day, but I'll leave that aside. But it is significant. And there, 
at, I'm sorry, not the Jericho, the, the Jordan River, of course. And the Jordan River was opened back in the days of Joshua when they were building a nation, when they were going in, and the war was in front of them, right? When they were at the Jordan River, and they were going, the war was in front of them to build their nation and to claim the, the land promise that God had given them. So both those times at the Red Sea and the Jordan River, when the rivers opened, it was a wartime scenario. So my, my understanding of this is, as the rivers open twice, it's still a wartime scenario. It's not a battle before them or a battle behind them. It's a battle raging all around them. And it's a spiritual battle for the truth of the Word of God, for the authority of God in their lives. It's a battle against the idolatry and the immorality that was eating away and destroying the nation. Baal worship is nothing different from what was going, than what's going on in America right now. American religion is Baal worship, mixed in with Moloch and the other idols of Israel as well. And so, this is the real battle being fought. We're in a battle, and we have to see that, a battle for souls. And so many blessings, but one of the blessings I could share is back around 9-11, when many people visited us and we started passing out gospel tracts and we gave out, I don't know, over 100,000 gospel, not me, but people who came and visited in the city and we sent them out. And anyway, Jeff Prophet, the brother with the white hat there, he received a gospel tract. He had been saved, but had never really lived for the Lord. It was very backslidden, smoking weed, doing his own thing. He got a gospel tract, but he didn't come to church right away. He actually, he saw in the tract that we had a radio program, so he started to listen to our radio program. And for four years, he listened to the radio. And one Sunday, I said, if you're out there just listening to the radio but not going to church anywhere, you need to find yourself into a good Bible-believing church. And he just felt I was talking to him, and I was. <laughs> and he finally came to our church. And, you know, God just began to bless in his life, and he came to the radio with me. He began serving. Here we are together at a, on a missions trip in Haiti after the earthquake there. And then God led him to such a lovely woman, Joy, and they have two beautiful children now, Juliet and Joshua. And Jeff is teaching our adult Bible fellowship in the morning and is one of our deacons now as well. And this is the warfare for souls that we must engage in. And by the way, if you look at the text, I'll just make one more point and then I'll move on. I like this where it says in verse 13, and I mentioned twice it says, and he took up the mantle. So there's something God wants us to see here through this repetition. It says he took up the mantle in verse 13. It says he stood. And then in verse 14, he took up the mantle and he smote. And that word smote is actually used in military battles when one nation would smite another nation. So it's like, it's like a battle word when he smites that water. And then he says, and that leads us to our third point. Oh, and I have this picture to just say, you saw Adrian Smith, one of our deacons earlier, and you see Jeff and Joy, and I've shown you a few other people, Pastor Carmine preaching today. Just pray for people to go through these doors because it's a spiritual battle to get, pray for a homosexual person to come through these doors and have that, that sin, the power of that sin broken. God can do it. God has done it with others and he'll do it again. And just pray for people as they come through their, these doors that they would be encouraged and they would be fed as they worship the Lord. And so the, the last question, not only what do you want and then what do you see, but the last question is whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? And so here is Elijah now into heaven. And Elisha picks up his mantle. As we just read, he smote the waters and then he said... And here is his prayer. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? So whom do you seek? Whom will you seek Elisha? Will it be, will you seek Elijah? Everybody actually wants him to go seek for Elijah. Where'd he go? Go find him. 
And he finally did. He didn't want to because he knew that Elijah's ministry was gone because he dropped the mantle. Elijah doesn't have the mantle, the symbol of his prophetic ministry. Elijah has it. And so now Elisha doesn't need Elijah anymore. He needs the God of Elijah. And the only way to have the God of Elijah is to seek him in prayer, to seek him in prayer. So what do you want? We must be filled with the Spirit. What do you see? We must be focused on eternal things. Whom do you seek? We must be fervent and seek God in prayer. And I'm thankful you're having this prayer meeting tomorrow, by the way. It's a blessing. And when you pray, you're, you're not going to pray. God, where is Ken Holcomb? <laughs> God, where is Pastor Holcomb? We want him to be 25 years old again so he can be our pastor for the next 30 years. <laughs> Elisha didn't pray. Where's Elijah? You see, when human leaders lay down their mantle and others take it up, our tendency is to still want them because we love them. But time moves on. And so now your prayer is, Lord, Where's the God of Ken Holcomb? <laughs> because the God of Ken Holcomb is the God of Elijah, is the God of the Bible. And this church and all of us do need to cry out to God, and he will answer our prayers. We need him. God answers prayer. You know, I know, I know God answers prayer because he's answered prayers. You know, when, you, you know he's answered if you're saved. He's answered your prayer. You called upon the Lord, and he saved you. He answered that prayer. If he can answer that prayer, he'll answer any prayer that's in his will. But God answers prayer. There's a book in the Bible called Samuel that means asked of God. There's two books in the Bible that remind us God answers prayer. God answers prayer. So we must seek him and be fervent in prayer. And as I close, I would just say, as I started on Friday night and I, I reminded us of the haystack prayer meetings in Williams College in 1806 where five young men gathered together at this haystack and prayed for the, the, the need of a lost world. In other words, what we're doing here as far as missions, a missions conference was born out of these haystack prayer meetings. It says on this site, five students dedicated their lives to the service of the church around the globe. And then when they graduated from Williams College and went over to Andover Theological Seminary, it says here that they gathered in this, in this little area, this secluded knoll. This, this plaque says they gathered at this secluded knoll and met, and met to pray. And I believe this. I believe that the missions movement that these men started, that we, they have dropped their mantle down and we have picked up the mantle. And, and, and one generation goes and another generation must pick up that mantle. And these men that laid this foundation were men of integrity, godliness, prayer, faith, and were so mightily used of God. We could say that is a good foundation to, to, to build upon, the foundation that Adoniram Judson and those early missionaries laid, and then following, you know, the men, men like Hudson Taylor and others and, uh, who went to, to all, all around the world. Judson went to Burma seven years before he saw his first convert, but never stopped praying never stopped seeking the power of God's Spirit in his life, never stopped understanding that there were great spiritual battles all around him, and then saw soul saved, translated the Bible into Burmese, and by the end of his ministry, 60 churches were established with 7,000 converts. So let us take up our mantle. Let us surrender. Will you surrender? Will you give your life? We need young people to surrender today. If there's anyone here who's never come to a place in their life where they've really surrendered their heart and soul to the Lord and say, Lord, whatever you'd have me to do, I'll do it. As Paul said to the Lord on that Damascus road, Lord, what would you have me to do? Surrender. Will you surrender? Let's stand together as we pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there anyone who'd say, Brother Matthew, 
I need to surrender my life to the Lord today. Is there a young person here today, perhaps, who's not surrendered their life? You say, I need to surrender my life to the Lord. I'm not saying you're going to go to the mission field. I'm just saying you're, you're going to surrender to be willing to do what God wants you to do. Start there. And then he'll lead you from there. Is there anyone who say, I need to surrender my life to the Lord today? I've not honestly done that before him. Can I see your hand? Is there anyone? Just slip your hand up that I could pray for you. Is there anyone at all like that? Or during this missions conference, is there any young person who'd say, I'm surrendering my life to the Lord? Maybe there's a mom or a dad, maybe a single adult say, I need to surrender. Anyone? So, Lord, you see our hearts, and we do pray that you would work mightily and that you would even call forth from this church those young men. Lord God, we pray that our culture would not raise up Jonas that would run from you, but that they would raise up Ninevehs that would go forth and build for you, or, or, or raise up Nehemiahs that would go forth and build for you, Lord. Please do your work and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.